Quality Christians. Hmm. Message today out of Proverbs, the second chapter. If you have your Bibles, I hope you'll follow along with me. In Proverbs, the second chapter, beginning at <clears throat> verse 1. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you'll understand what is right and just and fair and every good path. Talking about quality or maybe even another word would be authentic Christians. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago or more, I, I, I preached on the mystery of God. You know, the mystery of God, which was all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and how Jesus was willing to leave his throne in heaven, leave his father's side and all the glory that there was and come down to a sinful, wicked world and take on our sin and die a terrible death for us that we might be redeemed and have a home in heaven with him and that he's coming back someday to take his bride, us, to be with him in heaven forever. Now, one of the concerns that there is today in the Church of God movement that we're a part of, as well as other movements in the denomination, it seems to be a concern of, of all churches and pastors today in the world and the time that we're living in, and that is the shallowness of commitment. There seems to be just a lot of apathy and a shallowness of the commitment that once seemed to be evident in God's people and in His church. There's a, a man by the name of George Gallup. Some of you may know that name, but George Gallup Jr., he, he does a poll, and it's called the Gallup Poll. And sometimes it's a poll of uh, things in industry or and in things in the world, but he also does a poll of Christians and of churches. And here's something that he said. I want to read this to you. He says that American Christians, now this, this is terrible to even say, this, we shouldn't even say this. He said, most American Christians do not know the basic Christian teaching, and this is even worse, and are significantly, are not significantly different from Christians in their lifestyle. Imagine that, that in most Christians and most churches and Christian life do not know the basics of Christianity or the Christian teaching, and are not significantly different in lifestyle than the world. And if I understand the Scriptures correctly, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anybody is in Christ, they're a brand new creature, and the old is gone, and the new has come. And how in the world will we ever evangelize the world and win people to Jesus if they don't see we're any different than them? If we don't talk any different, if we don't act any different, if we don't even look a little different maybe at times and not dress like the world, if we don't go where the world goes and don't participate in the world, how are we going to have revival and awakening in America and see people saved and families come to Christ, neighbors and those that we love, if, there is no, if nobody knows the difference between you and I and them? So, and then he goes on to say this. He says that 10%, 10% of Americans, 10% are deeply committed Christians. 10%. You know, I thought about that. So if there's a church of 100 people, maybe only 10 are really committed. If there's a church of 50, maybe only five are really committed Christian. So now this is a survey that he's taken across the board of all kinds of denominations and groups. Only 10%. And then he, he begins to list some names of, and, and, and again, I don't even like listing these names. I'm just going to tell you up front because I've always had a, had a problem putting these names to Christians, but this is how he lists them. I don't, I don't think you can be a Christian in this number. 
I'm just saying that me personally. But this is what he says. He said the first one, a Christianity that makes no difference, is nominal, called nominal Christianity. And he says in there, they're just not really serious about the implication of their lives and the effect they have on other people. They're just nominal. It means they're not really committed, not really sold out, just kind of part-time. And then he says there's the popular Christian. And he says in that one, he says the level of commitment is practiced by a lot of church-going people, but not meaningful to anybody in any realm or shape or form, whether it's in church or outside the church. And then the other one, he says, is dead Christianity, which is just lifeless and dead. The last one, he says, is sick Christianity. He says, evidence daily on television in the life of nearly every congregation. Now, I, I would say that it's fair to say in, in that poll and the preachers that I've known and the 40-some years of ministry that I've been in and revivals that I've held in churches that I've pastored, I would say that we're probably living in a time now when God is really looking for men and women and boys and girls to really be sold out Christians, authentic, quality Christians that will make a difference not only in our lives, but in those that we love and that are around about us. What say the church? God's looking for that kind of authenticity. People who really want to make an impact in their world, who want to make a difference with those around us that we would keep the, the, the teachings and the practices of the New Testament church, that we would, you know, and the scripture says we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then everything else will be taken care of. He didn't say you need to seek the kingdom and God's righteousness second or third or lastly or when you feel like it or maybe sometime. He said seek first the kingdom of God and then and his right, then everything God will take care of you know, you know how it is. You know how it is in our lives. Sometimes we get so preoccupied with our life and our needs and our issues and our problems, and, and that takes first place over precedent of really seeking God's kingdom, which is love, joy, peace, and kindness. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is Jesus being king of our lives. He says we ought to practice that first. And then I like this. We ought to have joy not only in the good times but even the difficult times. How you doing? Can you have joy in the tough times? I see some heads going, hmm, I'm not sure. Yeah. You see, it's, it's easy. It's easy to be a Christian when the joy is flowing and everything's going good. When you've got enough money to pay the bills, you're not fighting with anybody, mom and dad are doing okay, the kids are doing okay, the job's okay, life's going good. You know, anybody can have joy in that. But as a Christian, we need to show the world, even when things aren't going well, we still have the joy of the Lord. You know, anybody can, you know, be a Christian when things are going well, but the world needs to see us that when things aren't going well, that we still have the joy of the Lord, that we still know that God is in control of our lives. And that's the one thing I believe with all the stupid stuff that's going on, all the chaos, that's, whether it's virus or violence or anger or what I know God is still in control that's what gives me a little peace and joy in this world if I didn't think God was in control I'd probably just want to stay home and bury my head but I believe God's in control amen, amen. operate on a different level on a, on, on a different level we, we should be in a different wavelength than what the world is totally different and, and so I want to share with you some things we call the discipline you know, you like, you like disciplines? <laughs> we got an honest one down front. <laughs> the first one for quality Christians is this. There needs to be the discipline of the written word. Now, the Amplified Bible on Proverbs said this. I like this. I'm gonna, he says, if you receive my sayings. Now, you understand if's a condition. If you remember back in Proverbs we read, when he'd go down through the list, he would say at different places, well, then you'll understand, or, or then you'll understand, it, it, you know, if, if this and this and this goes. And the Amplified said, if you receive my sayings, if you receive my word, and if you treasure my commandments within you, then this and this will happen. You see, Christians, quality Christians, should desire to know the word of God. You should want to know what God has. You know, some people say, oh, I don't hear from God. You want to hear from God? Just read the book. You read the book. In the beginning was the Word. <clears throat> and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. 
And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. If you want to hear God speaking to you, read the book. If you want to know how to raise your family, read the book. If you don't want to know how to be a husband, read the book. If you want to know how to be a wife, read the book. If you want to know how to be a son or daughter and respond to your parents, read the book. If you want to know how to be a leader in the church, read the book. If you want to know how to handle your finances, read the book. If you want to know anything, read the book. This is God speaking to us. We ought to desire it. We, want to, we ought to want to eat it. We ought to understand it. We ought to want to believe it. We ought to want to obey it. And we ought to want to live by it. David said in the Psalms 119, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, I will not sin unto him. And he says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you want to know how to walk, you want to know how to talk, you want to know how to be all that God wants you to be, and a quality Christian, read the book, understand the book, desire the book. Amen. Amen. And according to Gallup, What's happening? Many Christians don't read the book. They don't pray. They don't read the book. They don't understand. They're not solid. They're shallow. And I believe that we've got to go deeper. I believe our families depend on it. I believe our friends need it, and revival won't happen without it. The second discipline is the discipline of prayer. Verse 2, he says, cry out. Amplified says, listen. Make your ear listen. Incline your heart to understand it. Incline your heart. Cry out to God. See, to go beyond shallowness, we need to be a people of prayer. No great revival ever, ever, if you ever trace the great revivals of the past, no great revival ever started without prayer. People, even small groups gathering together on their knees before God, pleading, God, send revival. And if you don't think we need revival now, you need to be at this altar after this service is over. Our world is in a mess. We're in a critical time in our country, even for the election. And I try not to be political, but let me say you this. If we don't get the right person in there, this country could go down the tubes. We need to be people of prayer not just the word, but praying and seeking God. He says, cry out to God, call out to God. There can be little doubt that we need to be a people of prayer. Psalms 139, David said this in verse 23. And, and I've used this. I do this all the time. Every time I get up in the morning, if I miss one day of the week, it's unusual. But most every day I do this. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And here it comes. And see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to be people that pray and say, God, search my heart. You know, sometimes we don't know our own heart. Search my heart, God. Test me. See if there's anything offensive. Is there something in me that's not right, that you don't like, you're displeased with? Search me and, know, and test me and see if there's any way in me that you're not pleased with. In Psalms 42, another beautiful passage, there's even a song that the old church we talked about, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul's soul. So my soul thirst, thirst and pants for you, O oh God. Hmm. Do you really desire to know the word? Do you really have a desire to pray and talk to God? Quality Christians want to know the word. They want to digest the word. And they want to be a people of prayer. Thirdly, we talk about in the prayer part, Matthew 7, 7 says, you know, ask, seek, and knock. Our churches, our communities, and our world will suffer if we're not those kind of people. And here's another one, the discipline of inner desire. Inner desire to really know God, to really hear from God. What is God saying to me? What's God saying to you? What's he saying to Harvest Point Church? What is God saying? Uh, inner desire to really know what God is saying. Understand what God is saying in me. I want to know, God, 
what, what do you have to say? Uh, people, you know, people are going to hell. People are hurting. People are in need. And nominal, popular, dead, sick Christianity is in neutral gear. It will not get the job done. Real discipline in the Christian life are people of the word, people of inner desire for God, and people of prayer. And lastly, a discipline of daily consistency. <laughs> you know, when he said in Matthew 7, seek, knock. There's so much inconsistency today in this world. So much inconsistency is like one person says this, another person says, you don't know who to believe. You don't know who to believe. You don't know, this, this educator says this, and this, this educator says this, and this group says this, you know. We need consist Christians, quality Christians are consistent. That doesn't mean we don't have our times. It doesn't mean we don't have tough times. It doesn't mean that we might stumble a little bit and have to regroup and get up. But quality Christians are consistent. Their life is consistent. The walk is consistent. They, they, they are seeking. They're searching. They're, they're talking about God. They're looking for God. They're making every effort. You know, and, and they're digging in and digging in. One of the things in the Gospels, if you remember, that the Gospel was compared to like a, a, a pearl of great price that if found, they'd sell everything and take it, a treasure that was hidden, you know. Well, to find a treasure, you've got to do some seeking and searching. And it's the same with God. There, there has to be this consistency of being disciplined to regularly be a quality Christian in our lifestyle. Now, you know, we might look at a, I'm going to give you a little, uh, a checkup, quality Christian checkup. And we're going to take it from 1 John, the epistle in the back. A little quality checkup, just to see where we come in this as a quality Christian. First is 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is talking about a quality Christian walks in the light. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God's light in him, there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and don't do the truth. You understand? You could preach a whole message on that because what he's basically saying, if you're saying a Christian but you're not walking as a Christian, you're living fleshly, you're living sinfully, you're not doing, it's a lie. There, there, there is no such thing as that. And then he goes, but, in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with him and one another and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Walking in the light means simply this, we walk in truth. You know, I'm convinced I'm convinced after all these years that each of us have probably heard enough preaching, heard enough teaching, heard enough singing to know some truth. Amen? Most of us know, really, you know, maybe I'm wrong. It's my opinion. I know opinions vary, but I see some of you are agreeing with me. Most of us know, really, what God wants from us. And he's saying, if you just walk in that truth, that's what he means by in the light. The light that God, God, understand, hear me, God never expects you never expects you to do something you don't know. You're, we're only accountable for what we do know. Now, the problem is some people don't want to know. <laughs> I heard a story years and years ago when I was down south preaching, and uh, one of the pastors was saying, <laughs> and this is the truth, <laughs> he was saying in the, he was in a service, and it was kind of a real backward area, evident, and he prayed, God, keep me ignorant. Now, you know, that, that sounds funny, but you know what he was saying. If I don't know, I'm not responsible. If I don't know what God's expecting of me, I don't have to do it. And that's true. But are we supposed to pray, God, keep me ignorant? Don't, don't tell me where I'm wrong, or don't tell me where I'm right, or don't tell me what I ought to do. Just keep me ignorant, <laughs> you know? No, he's saying, if we walk, if we walk in truth, if, you, if each of us did just what we know to do without knowing more than that, we'd be quality Christians. Amen. Second one, and that is keep God's word and God's command. 1 John, the second chapter, and verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, a liar, and the truth's not in that person. So, next thing is 
Keep God's commands. Keep God's word. It goes back to what I was saying originally, a discipline of the word. We need to desire the word. Quality Christians keep God's word. Thirdly, we need to be people of desire to imitate Christ. 1 John 2, say it right there in verse 4, when it goes on to say whoever says he knows him but doesn't, look at verse 5. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how, this is how we know we are in him. Because we have love for God and we have a desire to imitate him and grow in him. Nextly is to reject. 1 John Second chapter, verse 15. We need to reject anything and everything that opposes God and God's word and God's truth. Do not love the world, verse 15, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the, the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, <laughs> the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Quality Christians reject anything that opposes God. You know, people often say, well, and I'm not going to get real political here, but I'm going to teach you something because it's important to vote. And that's your business, who you vote for. But according to what I understand in scriptures, we need to vote for whoever is the most godly and biblical that's in here. We need, don't need to vote for, well, this party, I've always been this party or this party. No, I vote. I vote. I vote for the person that's standing on what this word has to teach us. Not on my paycheck, not on because I was raised this way, or not because I was a part of this group, but we need to desire and reject, desire God, and reject anything that opposes God, anything that doesn't stand for God's word. There has to be, there has to be a difference between what, us and unsaved people. There has to be a difference. Then it's pursuing personal holiness in 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. I mean, imagine. Imagine we can be called children of God. God's kids. <laughs> and this is what we are. And the reason the world does not know us is because it didn't know Him. Dear friends, now, now we are the children of God. And, and I've preached on this at funerals for Christians. This is a marvelous passage. And, and we don't know yet what, you know, is going to be. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall see Him and be like Him. And then it says this in verse 3. And all who have this hope in Him purifies Himself even as He is pure. What He's saying is we need to pursue godliness, righteousness, and holiness. If we are the children of God and when He comes back we're going to see Him, going to be like Him, going to be with Him, then what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to live right. That's what He's saying. Pursue living right for God. That's all holiness is. It's not a set of rules and demands and do's and don'ts. It's simply I want to pursue living right for God because I want to be with God I want to go to heaven. I want to go with my mom and I want to see mom and dad. I want to see grandpa and grandma. I want to see my kids, my wife. I want to see you in heaven. But to do that, we've got to live godly and righteous. We cannot be a part of this world. And then we're overcomers, 1 John, the fourth chapter. I like this. 1 John 4 and 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Quality Christians are overcomers. We're not victims. Now, I, I'm not going to ask this question to respond, just I'm going to make a statement. Sometimes we act like we're victims. Woe is me. Poor me. Why am I treated like this? Why is this happening to me? Now, I've been there. <laughs> I'm not preaching anything I don't know and haven't gone through. There's times when you, and then God has to slap you, <laughs> yeah. And say, I'm not a victim. I'm an overcomer. I'm a winner. Jesus defeated Satan, rose from the dead. We know the outcome. We win. <laughs> Quality Christians are overcomers. We don't let the devil defeat us. We don't let the world defeat us. We're overcomers. And last but not least, quality Christians are filled with the Spirit. <laughs> Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with with the Spirit. Quality Christians want more of God. 
And when the cup gets empty, we say, God, fill it up. We used to sing a song, fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, Lord. So, we're supposed to be aggressive, strong, power in the hand of God. Committed. Hmm. Consistent, disciplined, prayer, and the word, desire. So, where are you at? <laughs> you know where you're at. You know where you stand with the Lord in relation to the Lord.